Gonna take you down to the bayou, to the bayou where I'll be. I am a native of the Gulf Coast region in Mobile, Alabama. I grew up hearing my grandmother sing songs and eating gumbo and fish and having fish fries and crawfish where you pop the, the crawfish and suck the head. And what's interesting is what was really amazing when I got here in D.C. today, it was so warm and I said, wait a minute, I'm in D.C. and it's eight o'clock in the morning, it's warm. So wait a minute, maybe they are learning from us. So where are the grits? So next time we have to have grits. So as I, I'm here today, and I'm a also, um, I've been an activist and organizer in the Gulf Coast region for most of my adult life. And I am also um, proud to say that I'm a surviving parent of a 17-year-old who recently told me that instead of being a scientist, he was gonna be a rapper. And I, and I say that because he actually inspired uh, the title um, of my presentation. Um, often, oftentimes you do a shout out for the different parts of the region and in the rap world, the South is known as the Dirty South. So in part of my presentation today, we're gonna talk about cleaning up the Dirty South. First, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about why is the Gulf Coast important to the United States? You know, there we talk, we see on television, we see um, the this great ecological disaster, and we know that the marine life and what's happening, but I think oftentimes what we really underestimate is the value of people. The people of the region are actually, that's the breath and the heart of that region. Um, what you'll see in the Gulf Coast communities, which is very different from some of the Gulf Coast states, you see diversity all across the Gulf Coast region. Uh, you see Laotians, Cambodians, there's Vietnamese, African Americans, Native Americans, Caucasians, Creoles, and Cajuns, and there's a very very rich and diverse culture across the region that adds not only to um, the beauty of that region, but the beauty of this country. Also energy. You may know that over 40% of the con this country's energy needs are actually met by that region alone. Um, it is a pervasive uh, relationship that we have with the petrochemical industries in that region. If you go down to Venice, all you, Venice, Louisiana, all you will see on the tr trip down, you will see petrochemical um, and refinery plants all across the region. And then the seafood, 41% of the seafood th that this country consumes actually comes out of Louisiana alone. And the culture from music to um, how many, I actually have a question, how many of you all have gone to, um, been to the region for vacation and participated in the culture? Wonderful. And so you can attest to the value and the beauty of the culture in that region. Then national security, just where the region is located geographically, and then tourism. So what I really wanna talk about is, I wanna talk about the narrative from a human perspective. What's going on with people? We're seeing images of the animals, we're seeing images of the shoreline, but, but oftentimes, I think one of the pieces that was very frustrating to people in the region, there wasn't a human face that was put to this disaster. So what I wanna do today is really just talk about um, what we're hearing from the ground over the last five years with the Gulf Coast Fund. I've been working with 100, over 170 community groups and grassroots groups all across the region, and many of these these groups are the first, they're on the front line right now because they actually live on the coast. And these are some of the issues that they're facing right now. One, there's a lack of transparency with BP. Early on, fishermen, we were meeting with fishermen, and they were saying that this spill is much greater than they're saying, and, but we can't get anybody to listen. And BP kept saying it was 5,000, but early on, many of those communities and the people who were really familiar um, with the region and some of the environmental groups that were actually doing early flyovers before they restricted the space were saying that it's far, far greater than that insufficient oversight of BP's operations. For, for, for the most part, BP has kind of been operating like a super state, <laughs> uh, where it, 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 it operates in a way where even local government has been, and even in some ways the federal government has been, particularly early on, looking for lead from BP instead of it being the other, other way around where there's, there was oversight. The cultural degradation of marginalized communities all along the Gulf Coast region, the economic collapse of the fishing industries, and the inconsistent claims process. There's a story, we were meeting with some fishermen who were in Biloxi, and we met with a group of, of uh, Vietnamese fishermen who didn't speak English in Biloxi, and they were offered almost half of what the white fishermen were offered um, in, a, in, in Louisiana. There was no consistency in the claims process. There was no consistency um, in terms of what people, uh, people received, and we saw there's some major gaps where when there were language barriers, and, when, and we saw those gaps in terms of language barriers 
and depending on where you were, who was your elected official, um, what, how your community was valued, there was no consistency in this claims process. Also, limited access to immediate physical and mental health care. People are breaking down. We're seeing that people are extremely stressed. This is a way of life. This isn't just about losing your job. This is actually losing the community that you grew up, that you knew, and people are really breaking down and under a tremendous amount of stress right now. The challenge in many of these communities, they're very isolated. Uh, they have very, very lim limited infrastructure, particularly in terms of and access to health care. So one of the communities that we've been working with in Barataria, the communities actually, the people who are working on oil spill, they actually have to go to BP and go within the gates of BP to see a, get a doctor to see them. Many of the fishermen are not going, many of the oil workers are not going because they're afraid that if they go in, they won't, and, and something is wrong, then they'll lose their ability to be able to make income for their families right now. And it's a very serious problem because there is a major, major Major, there's a major, major gap in terms of what health care access is available. Then the growing concern of long-term health impacts, we're seeing this burning of the oil, but what we're not hearing about is the impacts of the aerosols that moving on the shore. We've been hearing story after story of people having major re upper respiratory issues. We've been hearing stories and, and talking to fishermen who actually been working on the oil spill. And there, a couple of weeks ago, there were about 11 fishermen that went out. Three of them got very, very ill and were throwing up blood. Two of them actually had to go back um, had to go back to the hospital. I mean, there's some serious respiratory issues. One of the challenging things that's also happening, you don't see people with the respirators on. That, matter of fact, BP is not allowing people to wear, their workers to wear respirators, whether it's, you know, we can say whether it's they don't want the images to be shown or what have you, but people are actually put in a position where they're very vulnerable to the health impacts um, of the oil. The ecological impact of dispersants, the dispersants are going to the water column. So although we can't see it, it's going to the water column. And where do fish and other life? They're going through the water column. So um, early on, I have yet, and I've talked to hundreds of people on the region and scores of fishermen, I have not met a fisherman yet that is in support of dispersants. Not one single fisherman. Every environmental group, every environmental person, every fisherman that I've spoken with is adamantly, uh, adamantly opposed to using um, dispersants. And then the capacity and resource challenges for NGOs and community groups. You know, we're five years after Katrina. Um, uh, a lot of the work that you saw Actually, there's some really good things that have happened since Katrina, because right after Katrina, what you saw, that people, there was an infrastructure that started developing, that people were doing really good work, and people are in place and working together across the region, and a lot of people felt like this was kind of a launching space, where now there's some capacity and some infrastructure, and here comes um, a man-made disaster, BP. Who are the people of the Gulf Coast region? I think as we talk about this disaster, it's very important that we don't lose sight that this has a human face, that there are people who live here. And I heard uh, one of the stories earlier about why are, you know, why are we, uh, uh, why won't people just move? It's just imagine, I just want to take a moment and just imagine if tomorrow you were asked to get up and move to Sweden. That's what it feels like to people on the region. This is their life, this is their way of life. These are some of the people Derek Evans, oops, I think I, Derek Evans is actually one of the advisors uh, with the Gulf Coast Fund, but he's also, um, these, there are some phenomenal leaders and I just wanted to share their stories real quick with you. Derek Evans actually works in Turkey Creek and help, helped to keep 2,000 acres protected of green space and wetlands just by his efforts and some of the community people that he's working along with. You have Byron Ancolod, Byron is actually the president of the Louisiana Oystermen Association, but he also, he actually filed suit about 10 years ago, a decade ago, in terms of discriminatory practices that were used by the state of Louisiana and actually got a settlement for $25 million in terms of um, the, the African-American fishermen, actually they have decreased by 60% in less than 10 years. You have Dr. Wilma Subra, who is a chemist and MacArthur Fellow, and also the president of the Subra Company. Uh, early on, she works with one of the organizations called Louisiana Environmental Action Network, and early on, there was a, when the contracts, BP was actually offering people contracts, and in the contracts, for the most part, they had to give up their First Amendment rights. Okay, <laughs> they had to give up their First Amendment rights. That's Mike and Tracy, they are both uh, founders of Louisiana Bayou Keepers. 
You got Rosina Phillips, who, at Felipe, who actually is a part of the Atacapa tribe. They live on the bayou. They work on the bayou. Their homes are actually on, um, in the marshes. They've been living for 300 years there. Casey Calloway, who's a Mobile Bay keeper. And then four, four quick suggestions in terms of approaches of what, what we do for it. How do we clean up the dirty south? Approach one, we have to increase capital investment and business development opportunities. A lot of people are talking about, let's just retrain these people to, to actually be workers. There's a strong self-reliant and entrepreneurial spirit that people have, particularly in the fishing industry. So we want to consider having, um, investing in capital investments for cooperatives, fish farms, and supporting entrepreneurship opportunities for these folks. Approach two, diversify the economy in a multidisciplinary approach through developing green energy alternatives, healthcare, and education. Strengthen the social infrastructure and community capacity through creative philanthropy. Approach four, maximize the opportunities created by this oil spill by pushing for a national clean energy platform, support progressive economic policies that foster inclusion and equity, expand the national dialogue on economic sustainability, and then five, which is the last um, approach, increase access to technology and communications. There are some wonderful opportunities that exist now in terms of broadband access, technology infrastructure, and community control communications. We're one Gulf, we're one people, we're one future. In this great narrative, let's make sure that we remember that at the forefront of all of this are the people. It's not just about a geographic region, but it is the people of the Gulf Coast that make that region. Thank you.